is a question I have for you. Um, what is the operator that achieves this basis transformation, which is plus going to minus, uh, sorry, uh, zero going to plus and one going to minus. So remember, this is one orthonormal basis, right? So remember that uh, Trouble with my laptop. Okay, so remember that this is one orthonormal basis, and this is another orthonormal basis. We now know that these are eigenstates of uh, two different physical observables. Uh, this is the eigenstates of sigma z, and these are the eigenstates of sigma x. Right now, the question is, uh, what would, how would you write down an operator that transforms from one to the other, right? So in particular, I have specified for you a particular kind of transformation, which is zero going to plus and one going to minus, right? So the outer product actually gives us a very neat way of writing this down. So I'm going to call this transformation as H, okay? And I'm going to say uh, that, uh, so what do I need, right? So I need an operator that, when it picks up zero, it must rotate it to plus. When it picks up one, it must rotate it to minus, right? What do I mean by picks up? So this is what I mean. So remember that, so if I have an outer product of this form, Vw, right? Then this is, an, this is a linear transformation. It's a linear operator, right? And what does it do? When it acts on some arbitrary state psi, it takes the inner product with respect to W and then gives you a vector that is parallel to V, right? So this is how you can easily work out the action of the outer product. And every such outer product, since it transforms vectors to vectors, right? It transforms vectors to vectors. Unlike the inner product, which transforms vectors to scalars, right? It takes two vectors and gives you a number at the end of the day. This takes two vectors. When it acts on another vector, it's a transformation, right? When it acts on another vector, it's a transformation of this form. So now, using this piece of information, can you tell me in the outer product notation, what would be the operator that achieves this basis transformation? Can somebody spell this out for me? Ma'am, uh, a 1 by root 2 multiplicative factor outside. Uh, okay. And you have 1, 1, 1, minus 1. So you're giving me a matrix, right? Yeah. Okay, good. This is indeed the correct matrix. How did you get to this matrix? Bra plus, sorry, ket plus bra zero plus uh, ket minus ket plus bra zero plus ket minus bra one. Okay, so I have two different answers now. Okay, I think that was Bharati who gave me this matrix, and then um, Shiv Prasad is it? Sorry, what's your name? Uh, that's my, that's my Shiv Prasad. Yeah, Shiv Prasad. Yeah, okay. So Shiv Prasad has given me this. Now, are these two the same or different? Okay, so let's look at this because I was doing the outer product notation, so I wanted to look at this kind of a transformation. So this, I hope people are able to see that now when I act H on zero, what happens? The first term when I, the bra zero and the ket zero, you'll have to do the inner product. So let me just work this out once because people may be new to the outer product notation. Uh, those of you who did QMEC, was the outer product notation done? EP QMEC.
Yes, no, please. No, ma'am. Wasn't done. No, MSC? MSC QMEC. Have you guys seen out of product notation? Are the MSC students even here? Yes. Yeah, this was done, is it? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, this was done. Okay, fine, good. Right, so this now gives you uh, inner product of zero with zero, right? So this is one. Inner product of one with one is one, right? Oops, what am I doing? So I wanted to uh, act this on kit zero. Sorry, sorry. It's talking in the middle. Yeah. Okay, so this term vanishes, right? Because inner product of one with zero is zero. This gives me plus, correct? And when I do edge acting on one, Yes, I hope it's easy for you to check that you indeed get minus because when you take the, when you act this on a vector, the bra part of it becomes an inner product and leaves you with something like this. Now, what about this matrix? So, Bharati, you didn't tell me how did you get this matrix? Just uh, represented um, zero in terms of uh, plus and minus and one in terms of plus and minus. I try to good. represent uh, zero in, in terms of the other basis. So. Right, good, yeah. So that's, I think maybe I even indicated that in the first lecture or something. And so you can write down two, uh, you get two uh, equations, right? Two linear relations between zero uh, plus minus and one plus minus. And from that you can read off this matrix, right? So what she's saying is she wrote down zero as one over root two, uh, okay, so I'm writing the other way around now, all right? Uh, of course, you know that plus is 0 plus 1 by root 2 and minus is 0 minus 1 by root 2. That's what I've defined, but of course, you can invert the relations. I'm writing down the inverse relations, but it doesn't matter, right? So you can write it down either way. You can either write plus and minus in terms of 0, 1 or the other way around, right? And you can try to work your way towards this matrix from that. Now, how are these two things related? What you have here is some outer product notation, which also seems to give you the right answer. Now, if I take this matrix H and act it on H0, then you will see that you indeed get plus, right? What is uh, what is H0? This is the column vector 1, 0, right? So now in this matrix form also, you can figure out that this will indeed give you 1 over root 2, 1, 1, right? which is what, which is 1 over root 2, 0 plus 1, which is indeed plus, right? So this is also correct, and this is also correct. Now who's going to tell me how the two are related? How do I get to this matrix from this outer product notation? Uh, we write uh, ket plus as, uh, means, uh, yeah, ket plus as uh, 1 by root 2, ket 0 plus 1 by root 2, ket 1, and Get minus is one minus. Yes, and then yes, yes. Good. Yeah, very good. So this is very good. So you guys have given me three answers and you have helped me explain this concept very nicely now. So this is the outer product way of representing a linear transformation where you simply have to write down. So I know what the action on a certain set of ket vectors is. I know what the ket vectors transform to, 0 transforms to plus, 1 transforms to minus. So I can simply write down this outer product representation. Right? But note that this is not in any single basis. Whereas if I want to get to this matrix, I must write this down in some basis. Right? In fact, I must write this down in a single basis. Right? Because in the outer product form, this is now actually in multiple, uh, it's, it's in terms of 0, 1 and plus minus. It's not a basis representation, right? Whereas this is representing the uh, operation in some basis. And which basis is that? Indeed, this is a representation in the 0, 1 basis. So by default, all our matrix representations are in the 0, 1 basis, right? Because the 0 ket is our basis, it's, it's the 1, 0, and the 1 kit is the 0, 1, right? So all our matrix representations are by default with respect to the 0, 1 standard basis or computational basis, right? So how do you go from this to this? Indeed, now 
recall that plus is 0 plus, so plus minus is 0 plus minus 1 by root 2. So h, which was uh, sorry, stop is giving me a lot of trouble to get. Yeah, just give me a second. Okay, so you guys can work out the transformation where Yeah, you take the plus minus and you expand it in terms of the 0, 1 and okay, have I recovered? Yeah, okay, try not to be much better. Uh, yeah, let me resume sharing. Yeah. Ma'am, you cannot see the screen. Yeah, 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 indeed. <laughs> Neither can I at this point. Yeah, my my tablet is giving me trouble, which is kind of a dangerous sign because I have an entire semester of <laughs> teaching to do with this. Okay, can you all see my screen now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. So this is what I was saying that we will write down the plus minus as 0 plus minus 1 by root 2 and then we will use this um, to take this outer product notation and convert it into a matrix notation right a matrix form in a particular basis namely the 0 1 basis so please do that with me and just check that so this is 0 plus minus 1 get 0 here Please do this exercise because it's very useful to uh, tell you how to go back and forth between matrix and bracket notation. Right? And I hope you see that what you have now is 1 over root 2, 0, 0, plus 1, 0, plus 0, 1, minus 1, 1. Right? And this indeed is the outer product notation for this matrix with the 1 over root 2, overall 1 over root 2, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, right? Okay, so I hope you now see these connections between the matrix form and the outer product form. And this particular transformation is what is called the Hadamard transformation also called the Hadamard gate, okay? And it becomes a very important gate from a quantum circuit uh, point of view, from quantum computing point of view, because this is the gate that does this superposition, right? You give, you input a zero and it outputs for me a superposition, a uniform superposition of zero and one. You input a one, it outputs for me a uniform superposition of zero and one, with the non-trivial phase attached, okay? Now, I don't know whether uh, those of you who already have this matrix, have you done this check? So, what does H acting on plus give you? And what does H acting on minus give you? Okay? So, this is something that I want you to work out. Now, uh, you can either take this matrix and work it out. You can take this outer product representation and work it out. You can take this outer product representation and work it out, right? So it's up to you. Um, okay, but now I want you to observe some interesting properties of this H matrix. First of all, uh, so properties of H, uh, what is H dagger? Yes. Same as H. H dagger is indeed same as H. Very good. So H is Hermitian. Okay. But the other property that we'll actually be interested in is what is the product of H dagger H? Okay. Please work this out and let me know. 
I'm waiting for someone to tell me the answer. Okay. What is identity? identity. Okay, very good. Identity. So yes, this is indeed one over. This is actually just h squared, right? Because h dagger is the same as h. So this is a half one 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 minus one 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 minus one. And I hope you can see that this will indeed give me the two cross two identity matrix. Very good. So now, what about um, H H dagger? Yes, this answer should be even quicker. Identity again. Exactly. This is again just h squared, right? So this is also identity. So what kind of matrix is this? Those of you who know what this is. Unitary matrix. Indeed. So H is what is called a unitary matrix. And this brings us to this brings us to postulate three. Uh, of QMEC. So postulate three says that states transform via unitary operations. Actually, a more precise way of saying it is the following that Remember, so far we've only talked about the nature of states, the nature of observables. Right? States are vectors, observables are Hermitian operators. So the next thing is, how do you transform states? How do they evolve in time, etc.? So postulate three actually talks about time evolution, right? And this is what it says that if I have some state at time t is equal to zero, right? So this is the state of the system at t is equal to zero, then the state of the system at a subsequent time t is actually obtained by the action of a unitary matrix and this is a particular unitary matrix which takes you from time 0 to time t. More generally, if I wanted to know what is the state at some time t2, when I know the state at some time t1, then again this happens via the action of a unitary matrix on the state where this Unitary now is the time evolution operator corresponding to two different times T1 and T2, right? So this again, contrast to classical case, you have equations of motion, right? And solving those equations of motions in the classical case gives you a deterministic path in phase space along which the system evolves, right? This is again no longer possible in the quantum case. So where does this unitarity aspect come in? So first of all, what is a unitary matrix? Well, this is a unitary matrix. What we just saw here, this property that H dagger H is identity, H H dagger is identity. So that defines the unitary matrix for you. So U is unitary. If U dagger U is the same as U, U dagger is identity. And this would be the identity matrix in whatever dimension um, you're acting, uh, you're, you're working in, right? So if it's a d-dimensional quantum system, this will be d cross d matrices, and this identity will be a d cross d identity, right? So this is what is the definition of a unitary operator is. Now note that because u dagger u is the identity, uh, you can see that u dagger is the same as u inverse, right? So a unitary matrix is it always represents reversible dynamics, right? And this is very important, okay? Uh, the inverse of a unitary operator is always well-defined. In fact, it's nothing but the adjoint. Uh, remember, we're talking finite dimension and all that, so we're not worrying about the infinite dimension inside of Hilbert spaces now, but even there, there are ways to make this well-defined, right? So the inverse of a unitary operator is always well-defined, and it's nothing but the adjoint of the operator itself, right? Um, this, you can also look at this and say that you, uh, okay, so let me not write the commutator, maybe write that later. 
Okay, so why unitary operators? And I can give you two kinds of answers to that. Uh, so first of all, the time evolution equation, right? The time evolution from a physics point of view is governed by the Schrodinger equation, right? So can someone tell me what this time evolution equation is? Let me write this as d psi by dt. Yes, what do I have to add to the left? What do I have to write on the right? On the left, it will be i h bar on the right. Oh, sorry, on the left, it will be i h bar. On the right, it will be uh, the Hamiltonian operator. Indeed. So let me... Uh, write this Hamiltonian as a slightly different kind of H, okay? To contrast it from the Hadamard gate that I've written above. Okay, fine, this is okay? Right, so this operator here is what is called the Hamiltonian associated with the system. The Hamiltonian is, I'm just going over this very quickly for those of you who haven't done a quantum mechanics course because I think this should be mentioned just for completeness sake, see, we won't do dwell on dynamics in this course really, right? Because this course is more about computation. Uh, we're not going to dwell so much on the dynamics, but dynamics do become important, especially when you start thinking about noise and decoherence and things like that. So it's important to know this. Uh, so this Hamiltonian is the Hermitian operator that is associated with the energy observable, right? With the energy of the system. So just like how in classical physics you would write down the energy relations, right, the potential and kinetic energy, once you define those for a particular system, that kind of governs the dynamics of the system. In a similar way, you have to write down the Hermitian operator associated with the energy of the system, that is what is called the Hamiltonian, and that dictates the time evolution in this form. Now, this Hamiltonian itself could be time dependent, but again, let's assume that for simplicity, I mean, these are all things that are dealt with in different courses. This course shall not dwell upon time dependent Hamiltonians and things like that. So let's say that H itself is independent of time, right? Then the solution of this equation actually can be written down as psi at some time t is nothing but e to the minus i h uh, t by h bar. Okay. Well, I can omit the h bar if I wish, but anyway. Uh, so let's write it like this, right? So this is a solution to the equation. This is how the solution looks. This is of course a repetition for those of you who have done your full-fledged QMED courses. Uh, but like I said, I want to mention this for completeness sake. Now, what is this e to the i h? Okay, so let me just abstract that out. So let me just look at this part. Let's look at e to the minus i h t by h bar. So the t, h bar, etc. are just scalars, right? they're just numbers. But the key part is I'm taking the exponent of an operator. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Now, it's very easy to visualize what this means. So this is the exponentiation of an operator. In fact, this is exponentiation of a Hermitian operator. Now recall that Hermitian operators are diagonalizable, right? I said this, I just mentioned this last time, right? So what do I mean by that? I can expand H in terms of some set of eigen um, values and eigen states, right? Let's say that this is some d-dimensional system. There are d-distinct energy eigenstates. 
So what are these? So EI is an energy eigenvalue. And the ket EI is the associated energy eigenstate, right? So essentially they all satisfy an equation of this form, right? And we recall that you can form an orthonormal basis out of these eigenstates, right? And since it forms an orthonormal basis, you can represent any state in terms of this. In particular, you can work out a representation of a Hermitian operator. It will purely be made up of these uh, projection uh, outer products, right? Remember this, each of these is a projection operator, right? And if you write this in a matrix form in this basis, in the EI basis, this is obviously going to be a diagonal matrix, right, of the form E1, E2, etc., EB, right? Okay. So, why am I doing all this? Well, because I want to tell you how to do exponent of a matrix. Now that I have this uh, eigenvalue uh, decomposition, so I will, I don't think I've called it that. So, when you write down, so this is what is called an eigenvalue decomposition. Okay. Now, e to the h, right? Can someone read off what e to the h is by looking at this outer product representation? So, first of all, note a few things. If h is Hermitian, what about e to the h? Okay, so let me say one way to think about what e to the h is, is the way you would think about e to the x or e to the any function, any scalar function, right? So what would the expansion of that be? Yes? Like one plus h. h. Correct. So now what do you have to replace one by? Identity. Identity. Indeed. So now you are talking about an operator, you're talking about taking the exponent of an operator, right? So this is nothing but I plus H plus H squared by two factorial plus, et cetera, right? So when I have a, uh, well-defined operator, okay, and of course, let's say that all Hermitian operators are in this class, then the exponent of the operator is simply the corresponding operator function, right? So, this is like saying, so how did I write down? So, earlier I wrote down some h squared, right, where h was the harder mark. So, just like how I take a, a variable, a real variable, and I write down functions of variables, similarly, I can associate functions of operators, right? So I can write down x squared and I can write down h squared. If I can write down any polynomial function of x, I can write down any polynomial function of h, right? And exponent, the logarithm, they're all polynomial functions, right? So they all have polynomial expansions. So I can essentially then write down this kind of a polynomial expansion for the exponent of h, right? And now hopefully it's easy for you to see that two things. First, if H is Hermitian, then E to the H is also Hermitian. Okay? You can just do a quick check, right? Take the adjoint. So, how do I do the adjoint now? Do the adjoint term by term, right? H dagger is H, H times H, so and so on and so forth, right? So, you can now easily see that if H is Hermitian, E to the H is also Hermitian. Second and most importantly, I can write down the commutator of H and E to the H. Okay. So maybe I should have noted the commutator above. I had an opportunity to discuss that. But anyway, let me say that here. So the commutator of two matrices A and B or two operators A and B is simply A times B minus B times A. Okay. We'll revisit this in the next lecture when we discuss measurement, 
uh, this will become a very important aspect of being able to do measurement, right? So, some of you may have already seen it. Many of you may have already seen it. Some of you may not have seen it, but the commutator is an important object, uh, especially in quantum mechanics and for quantum computing. So, what is the commutator of H with E to the H? In particular, do H and E to the H commute? So, does any operator commute with itself? Yes or no? Yes, right. So, every operator commutes with itself. So, does H commute with the exponent of H? Guys, yeah. yes or no? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. So, when I say that the commutator of something with uh, itself is zero, I mean, when I say that this commutes with itself, I just mean that the commutator is zero. So, you say that A, of course, commutes with itself. If I have two operators B and C whose commutator is zero, then I will say that B and C commute. Right? So, this is zero. And what is interesting and important is that when two operators commute, so commuting operators can be diagonalized. Yes, those of you who know what I'm going to say next, what am I going to say about commuting operators? What is special about commuting operators? I think that they follow the same uh, similarity transformation. They can be diagonalized simultaneously. They can be diagonalized simultaneously means what? They can be diagonalized. The same similarity transformation can be used. To so they can be diagonal in the same orthonormal basis. Right? So you can identify a single common eigenbasis or set of eigenstates for commuting operators. So this is what Neil Kant was talking about as simultaneous diagonalizables. They can be simultaneously diagonalized. Right? So why is this important? Because then I can write down e to the h is it has the same set of eigenstates, or at least I can write down a common set of energy eigenstates for both the Hamiltonian and the exponent of the Hamiltonian. What will change, however, is the corresponding eigenvalue. And that's again easy to see because what is e to the h acting on one of these eigen um, vectors? Remember, ei is an eigenvector of h, right? So now expand. Expand this. So, what do you get? E to the power EI. Indeed. So, you will simply get E to the power EI, get EI. Okay. So, what we have established is that every energy eigenstate, every eigenstate EI, which is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, is also an eigenstate of the exponent of the Hamiltonian. Okay. In fact, we can make this more general and say that if I have a Hermitian operator A, okay, with some set of eigenvalues and eigenstates like this, then any function of A, any function of A has the same set of eigenstates with the corresponding eigenvalues simply becoming the corresponding functions of the eigenvalues of the original operator, right? Let me just say polynomial function. Right. So, now let's get back to time evolution, right? That's where we started and then we had to understand exponentiating operators and in particular Hermitian operators and seeing that this, so now 
what I was coming to is that this eigenvalue decomposition uh, simply carries through for the time evolution operator. So now back to time evolution, we said that the solution to the Schrodinger equation looks like this. Whenever I have a time, time independent Hamiltonian and I said this operator is nothing but an operator that has the same, uh, it, it is diagonal in the same uh, basis with corresponding eigenvalues as E sub i t by h bar, right? Okay, so this is good. This helps us understand this operator. But I want to now look at this operator a bit more closely. Uh, we have established that if h is Hermitian, e to the h is Hermitian, right? Now, what about this time evolution operator? Let me call this the time evolution operator, right? This part, which is acting on this. So, what is the joint of this operator? Is it Hermitian? E to the H is Hermitian. Is E to the I H also Hermitian? Let's write this down. So this becomes identity plus I H minus H squared by two factorial minus I H cube by three factorial plus uh, right, h to the 4 by 4 factorial, etc. I'm sure you guys can work out this expansion. So please tell me what is e to the i h adjoint? Quick. It's wrong minus i h. Does everybody see that? Good. So let's do this again adjoint term by term. So you will see that this becomes Identity minus i h because now this i is sitting here, right? Of course, this minus h squared by two factorial is the same. Then this becomes plus i h cube by three factorial, etc. Right? And I hope it's easy to see that what you're writing down is actually the expansion of e to the minus i h. Okay. So what do you conclude? E to the i h is not Hermitian. Right, because its adjoint is not the same. E to the h adjoint was e to the h itself, right? So this is not Hermitian, but it is something else. And what is it? So e to the minus i h times e to the i h. Yes, will give me identity. Okay. Uh, again, you can do the expansion term by term, work this out, etc. But you can check that this will give me identity. So the point I'm trying to get at is that this time evolution operator, which was e to the minus i uh, h t by h bar. Remember the t h bar, etc. are just numbers coming along for the right. The operator properties only in the Hamiltonian. This is a unitary matrix or a unitary transformation. And this is what we refer to as u t comma z. Okay, so this is one way to understand where the unitarity aspect comes in, that it actually comes in from the Schrodinger equation. The solution to the Schrodinger equation lies in taking the exponent of a Hermitian matrix. The only property that we used in analyzing all of this was the fact that the Hamiltonian is Hermitian. So obviously, whatever I've said holds for any Hermitian operator, right? that the exponent of the Hermitian operator is also Hermitian. The exponent will commute with itself. But when I take e to the i times the Hermitian operator, I do not get another Hermitian operator. Rather, I get a unitary operator, right? And this now governs the time evolution of quantum states. Mathematically, there's another crucial reason why time evolution must happen unitarily, okay? 
and why it can actually be a postulate, right? Uh, and one need not even write this down from Schrodinger equation. Okay, here I gave you a kind of physical solution where I said this is the time evolution equation from which this operator comes about. Mathematically, here is what the interesting property of the unitary operator is. So let's say that phi is u psi. Okay, so u is some unitary operator. Psi is some state and the output uh, or the state you get after the transformation is phi. So I want you to evaluate what is the inner product of phi with itself, right? How would you do that? So remember when you take the uh, joint ket, right? When you take the bra of an equation like this, then this has to become bra psi u dagger, right? The order in which you do the product has to change, right? Um, so this is what happens when you go to the dual space, right? The vectors are on the left, the row vectors and the matrices are on the right. This is what happens when you go to the dual, right? Please keep this in mind. So now what happens? What is this inner product? Well, so this is psi u dagger u psi, but u dagger u is identity, right? So this is simply psi psi. So unitary transformations preserve the norm. Okay, so this, I want to call it the third crucial property of unitary transformations. The first being the fact that they are reversible Okay. The second being the fact that they are actually the time evolution operators coming out of the Schrodinger equation, right? And the third being the fact that they are norm-preserving transformations. In fact, they are the only norm-preserving transformations. If I want to do a matrix transformation which will preserve norm, then that matrix had better be a unitary matrix, okay? And this is a kind of mathematical or axiomatic reason why quantum states must transform only according to unitary transformations. They are the transformations that will conserve probabilities for you, right? And so they are the transformations that are physically allowed for any closed quantum system, okay? So, what is the significance of all this for quantum computing? So as far as quantum computing is concerned, quantum gates yes. uh, are essentially, yeah, just let me just complete this. Quantum gates are essentially unitary matrices. Okay. And if it's a d-dimensional quantum system, then the quantum gates, the logical operations will all be realized not by any, not by any D cross D matrix, but by D cross D unitary matrices, okay? And now you can go back and check that whatever gates we have written down, they're all unitary. So for qubits, which are two dimensions, the gates are all two cross two, unitary matrices, the set of two cross two unitary matrices constitutes the set of quantum gates, allowed quantum gates. Yeah, Nilesh, you had a question? No, no, it's clear. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so we can go back and check that the gates we wrote down, especially in the last few lectures, we wrote down X, Y, Z, or the corresponding, you know, sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z, which were the op physical operators with a factor of H bar associated with them. So check that these are all unitary transformations. 
we have also written down one more quantum gate now, namely the Hadamard. The Hadamard is actually the basis transformation gate, if you wish. And this is also, of course, unitary. Right? So, this is the time evolution postulate, which as far as quantum computing is concerned, tells us what is the allowed class of transformations for quantum states. How do you realize quantum logic operations? Well, you realize them via unitary transformations, right? And interestingly, these Pauli matrices or the resulting gates that come out of it, the X, Y, and Z are not just uh, unitary, they're also Hermitian. The Hadamard also, interestingly, has this property that it is both Hermitian and unitary, right? And these two different properties of matrices give us two different physical uh, inter physical meanings. One governs time evolution, norm preserving. The other represents physical observables and their values via eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, okay, so did anyone work this out? What is the Hadamard acting on plus? What is the Hadamard acting on minus? I'm zero. I'm on plus zero and zero. minus plus two one. Yes, very good. So, so this then gives you another outer product representation, right? For the Hadamard. Can you read off the outer product note uh, representation that you get from this? So this is zero plus plus one minus. And indeed you can check that this gives you the same matrix, right? So what this tells you is, and actually this shouldn't surprise you. Why shouldn't this surprise you? Because we saw that the Hadamard is Hermitian. And because it is unitary, the inverse is the same as the adjoint itself. Right? So, in fact, the inverse is the same as the matrix itself. Yes? So, the unitary matrix, what is more, H inverse, which is H dagger, is H itself. Okay? And this is an interesting property. Like I said, those set of unitary matrices which are also Hermitian will have this property that the inverse will be the same as the matrix itself. So if the matrix takes you from 0, 1 to plus minus, then the inverse must take you from plus minus to 0, 1. Right? Okay. So I have a few more minutes. Uh, any questions? Okay. So the last thing. Is yeah. it only true? Ma'am, is it only true for uh, uh, when Hamiltonian is time independent? The unitary transformation. No, no, no. That is when the unitary transformation is easily right, uh, derivable from the Hamiltonian in this form. Right? Time evolution is always unitary. Okay. Yeah. Sorry if I gave you that interpretation. All I wanted to say is if you assume the simplest case where the Hamiltonian is time independent, then you can easily write down the unitary operator that corresponds to time evolution. In every other case also, whether, no matter how complicated your system Hamiltonian is, the time evolution is indeed unitary. How you work out what that unitary operator is will get a bit more complicated. You have to do some series expansion, you have to do some time ordering and all of that. Right? There are some techniques to do that. It's just that the simplest case of the Schrodinger equation, which is what we often study in all these core in, in where you have some fixed potentials which are not changing with time, then this Hamiltonian is typically independent of time, right? So the simplest and somewhat commonly studied case, you can write down this time evolution operator immediately. That's all. So remember I stated the postulate independent of uh, Schrodinger equation, right? The postulate holds that time evolution states transform via unitary operations and there is always a unitary operator of this form that relates the state at a particular time to the state at another time. Right? Okay. Uh, so, the final thing I wanted to talk about is actually 
what is called the spectral theorem. Um, or diagonalize it, right? So I just mentioned and I kind of justified that if an operator is Hermitian, right, then it admits a diagonal representation of the form A is sum over I, lambda I, E I, E I, right? So The more formal way of saying it is that if A is Hermitian, then there exists a unitary matrix. I mean, these are concepts that many of you may have seen in linear algebra courses. I do not know, uh, but I just want to mention some of these things for completeness sake. Then there exists a unitary matrix U such that U A U dagger is D, where D is a diagonal matrix. Right? So this is an exercise that people would have done when you're transforming a matrix to its diagonal form, you know that the matrix that you have to use is a unitary matrix. So why unitary? Why is it that a unitary matrix is the one that transforms from one matrix representation to another? In fact, we saw that the unitary is the one that transforms from one basis to another, right? So why is that? Sorry. Okay, I can't hear you, Ravi Khan. You can type this. So the answer lies in the fact that unitary transformations are the ones that preserve inner product. Right? So if I have two vectors E i E j and their inner product is zero if i is not equal to j. If I now consider the transformed vectors u e j and u e i and then I call them, okay, I can call this a b. So this is the last thing I want to say and I'll stop the class with that. So I have e i tilde which is u e i and Uh, I have E j tilde, which is U e j, then E i tilde, E j tilde is then E j u dagger U i, and this is equal to that. So if I started out with something that is orthogonal, then I end up with something that is orthogonal. Okay, so unitary matrices preserve inner product. I mentioned this is a specific case when I said they are norm preserving, but in general they are inner product preserving. So one orthonormal basis uh, can be transformed to another via a unitary transformation, right? And so what we are doing in this diagonalization is essentially A is Hermitian. If it is not diagonal, it is not represented in its eigenbasis, right? So this is the eigenbasis corresponding to A, right? So what we need is an appropriate unitary transformation, which will then transform the matrix to its diagonal form. What we are in essence doing is doing a basis transformation of this form where the same unitary matrix is acting on every vector of one basis to give you the vectors of the other basis, okay? Yeah, let me continue this next time, which is Monday. So Monday's class is at 9 a.m. because we are following uh, Friday's timetable on Monday.
So, any questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, let me stop here. I will uh, basically discuss measurement on Monday, which is the class is at 9 a.m. Um, we'll make use of everything that we have said in this class, Hermitian, unitary, basis transformations, etc. Um, and I think with Monday's class, the basic discussion will be over of quantum mechanics and linear algebra, and then we can get into more interesting quantum information concepts. All right, see you all on Monday.